Hello everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone here for our 40th annual fall training. My name is Joseph Silva. I am the president of the Child Protection Council and I'm also the Family and Youth Service Coordinator for the Board of the Housing Authority. The mind-body connection, relax, be well, the art of appreciation, empathy and the tool of communication, mindfulness, the pathway to present breathing basics. It's going to be our presentation today. Every fall, we recognize an individual and an organization in the greater Florida area. This year, uh, we have saw, uh, do we have anyone here from Gifts to Give? Any volunteers? No. I'm uh, still going to acknowledge them. Their tangible mission is Gifts to Give is a magical place. Thousands of local children come here to engage in giving the, in service. We call it tangible philanthropy in the big citizenship. Kids donate their gentle used clothes, toys, books, and things they no longer need and or use and volunteer at our huge repurposing center to process. Organize and package tons of donations, transforming them into thousands of individual gift packages. Hundreds of local agencies and caregivers go online and order customized gift packages for homeless and at-risk children in their care. All this is made possible through the skill, set, and commitment of our volunteer management team. So the Greater Fall River Child Protection Council acknowledges gifts to give for their work with children and families. Training is sponsored by People Incorporated, so I'd like to thank Mr. Burl Perkins and your agency for sponsoring this event. At this time, I'm going to call up two of our committee members who represent People Incorporated, Renee Helton and Deb Lavoie, and they're going to award the individual this year. Year, the Child Protection Council provides an award to an individual for their work and commitment to children and families. This year's recipient is a stellar example of professionalism and a dedication to family. Her devotion to family begins at home as a role of mother, wife, and sister. She is the rock and the cornerstone for her extended family. And of course, she extends herself into her community where she is often seen singing at the choir at our local church, attending funding events, and participating in community boards, and even offering lectures on topics of interest. Robin is a magna cum laude graduate from, Roger, from Rhode Island College with a bachelor's <coughs> of social work. She began her career in the human service field in the 1990s, and since that time has impacted and supported the lives of hundreds of families and hundreds of children. Her work history depicts her dedication to families. She was a family advocate, life advocate at the Fall River Resource Center. Her roles included helping, uh, helping families obtain permanent housing, developing service plans, networking with other community agencies, and implementing workshops on topics such as parenting skills, <coughs> child development, nutrition, and stress management. All of these prepared her for her future work with families in the community. In 1998, she joined the Early Intervention Team of People Incorporated as a service coordinator. She continued her work with families and children, offering support in the area of child development, social skills, resources, and parenting. She ran a parent group for children, was medically involved, was a mentor for new staff, and a great support to all staff. She was later promoted to supervisor, then clinical coordinator of the early intervention program. She assisted in keeping the EI program running smoothly. Some of her responsibilities included, but were not limited to, supervision of staff, training new staff, attending collaborative community meetings, and much, much more. Robin's, Robin's expertise and solid work ethic led her to her current position of Director of the People Incorporated Early Intervention Program and our Early Intervention Partnerships Program. 
She continues to lead the EI and EIPP teams with tireless passion, <coughs> thoughtfulness, and genuine caring for not only our families, but for her own staff. She always puts others first, thinking of their families, their complex lives, and empathizing with what they are going through. Her community engagement activities have thrived. Over the years, she has been a member of the CHNA, the Foster Care Task Force, the TILT, which is the Trauma-Informed Leadership Team, the MEEK, the Massachusetts Early Intervention Consortium. She is active with the Southeast Directors Meeting of MEEK, including being the Recording Secretary. And the past two years, she shadowed the MEEK Board President and was the President-elect of the MEEK Board. In July of 2016, she became President of the MEEK Board. This will be a two-year position. She attends many community meetings and is involved with many committees to further assist in continuing the collaborative work for families and children. To summarize, Robin is one of those individuals that makes others shine and is happiest when she's helped change another life for the better. Her open door policy is just one example of how her leadership style is both welcoming and supportive. Her guiding principles of integrity and compassion make her always stand up for those who she believes in, and as a result, she certainly has left a trail of success behind her. I can't think of anyone more deserving as an individual who truly is committed to the well-being of children and families. It will be with my great pleasure and pride that I announce Robin Jones as this year's recipient of the Child Protection. Concerning to my husband and I 
was that at around 12 months of age, his weight gain started to slow down, and then it started to plateau, and then he started to lose weight. And then at his 15 month checkup, when they did the measurement of his head circumference, his head had stopped growing. So my husband and I knew that meant that his brain wasn't getting the nutrients that he needed. We embarked on a journey to try and figure out what was going on. I was pregnant with my second son at the time. And the great news was all the scary things were being ruled out, but nothing was being ruled in. And we found ourselves with Thomas being about 15, 16 months of age, eating one green bean a day if we were lucky, and drinking water. Finally, we found the right physician that gave him the diagnosis of FPIES, F-P-I-E-S, and that stands for Food Protein Induced Enterocolitis Syndrome. It's a big mouthful, that's why we call it F pies, and the kids call it French fries, whatever you want to call it, right? <laughs> so in essence, what F pies does is when somebody ingests the um, trigger food, unlike a traditional food allergy, it induces inflammation and cellular damage along the whole GI tract. For Thomas, that had been going on for so long that he actually had some internal bleeding. So we found ourselves with a newborn baby and a two-year-old that needed an NG feeding tube. For those of you that don't know, that's the feeding tube that goes from the nose down into the belly. And that was stressful, but we made it. I think people referenced and Robin referenced like family support. We had a great village of family helping us, um, our own early intervention team, a great group of medical professionals. Made it to the other side, we turned three, thriving, doing really well. And flash forward to right before my boys' second and fourth birthdays, they came down with a virus. Now, William was robust because his immune system had never encountered the trigger food, but Thomas wasn't so lucky. So we found ourselves up in a hospital in Boston. Thomas was gray and really lethargic, not really very responsive. And I remember the resident was talking to us and left the little room, and my husband said to me, oh my gosh, did you see like all those kids out there? We're going to be here all night. And before I could say anything, in walked the resident, and then in walked the head of the emergency department and the head of the OR, and you name the head of the hospital, it felt like they were in our little room. And my husband got this big smile on his face, and he was like, this is awesome, we're not gonna have to wait all night. And I looked at him and said, oh, it's a lot of things, but it's not awesome, it's not. And so sure enough, Thomas's body wasn't able to fight the virus off, and things were shutting down. We didn't really know why, we didn't really know what, all that we knew was that it was touch and go. Hard time as parents. Thankfully, he made it out onto the other side. Um, but when he did come home, our stress level was really up here. No longer was our intervention coming to the house because he was four. I had a two-year-old that had a lot of services. So my husband and I sat down to figure out how are we gonna mitigate all the stress that we're feeling as a couple, which is in turn impacting our children. We sat down at the kitchen table, and my husband and I were trying to figure out what is it that we're gonna do. And the brilliant idea we came up with to mitigate my stress was to leave the job that I loved to, watch the air quotes, just stay home with the kids. How hard could that be, right? I'm just going to stay home. So needless to say, I did. And as I did, my stress went through the roof. And that had a negative impact on my kids. But I kept on going. Because I think so often, whether you're a caregiver as a mom or as a profession, you just keep going, regardless of when the signs are telling you, maybe it's time to slow down. In my case, I ended up with a red, angry rash from head to toe. My joints swelled up. And it wasn't until I started losing my hair that I thought, maybe I should get a handle on what's going on here. And so I pulled out a binder of techniques that I'd learned years before my husband and I were going through some infertility challenges of mind-body medicine. I actually used these techniques with my boys when they were in the hospital. So if they were getting 20 vials of blood drawn, I was using this technique. If the IV blew out, I was using this technique. If I was holding them before anesthesia, I was using this technique. And everybody from the anesthesiologist to the phlebotomist to the nurses would say to me, how are you keeping your boys so calm? And I would sort of go, I don't know, I'm just using these things. And so I started to use it with the boys and noticed a huge difference. They were sleeping better, they had less behaviors. More importantly, Thomas started to eat. Thank you so much. How's that? Oh, and that was huge for him because he didn't have an appetite signal until he got to be 10. And so I figured if it was working for my boys, it most likely would also work for their mom. I started using the techniques and finally got my husband on board. And we noticed a huge shift. All right, so that leads me to what are we gonna be doing today? What are, what are my hopes for you? One is I want you guys to have knowledge. When you leave, I want you to have an understanding of 
what is stress, what's the stress response, and why should you care about those two things. That's number one. Number two is I want you to start to build awareness that your brain and your mind are actually connected to your body. I know that seems silly, but I'm going to give you an example. How many of you get